Hello again, something a little bit different today. So I've obviously tried things like chat GPT or whatever, yeah, the, the AI that everybody's talking about. But I've also been invited to try Google's one called Bard. Now, I'm interested to see what responses each of them has with the same prompt. And what if you get a prompt from one and give it to the other one? Can we play AI versus AI? I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. So let's try Bard first. So something interesting. So what should we come up with? Something a little bit different. Now I've asked it previously with the other version of the AI to write a short story. So let's have a look. Right, a short story about a mirror monster so let's see how long that it takes i'll try and keep this in real time so you can see exactly how long it actually takes for these prompts to work so it should be interesting to see the speed difference between the two services and here we go wow that's not bad so let's read through shall we once upon a time there was a young girl named alice who lived in a small town Alice was a curious and adventurous girl, and she loved to explore the woods near her house. One day, Alice was exploring part of the woods that she'd never been to before when she came across a strange mirror. The mirror was old and dusty, and was covered in strange symbols. Alice was curious about the mirror, so she decided to take it home with her. Unusual. Okay, then. When Alice got home, she put the mirror in her bedroom. That night, as Alice was getting ready for bed, she looked into the mirror and saw a strange creature staring back at her. The creature had sharp teeth and claws, and had glowing red eyes. Alice was terrified, and she screamed to her parents. The parents came running to the room. But when they looked in the mirror, they didn't see anything. Alice's parents didn't believe her, so they told her to go back to bed, but Alice couldn't sleep. She kept thinking about the creature in the mirror. The next day, Alice went back to the woods to look for the mirror. She found it in the same spot where she had found it the day before. Alice was scared, but she was also curious. She wanted to know what the creature in the mirror was. Mm. Alice looked into the mirror again and again this time and this time the creature was even closer Alice could see its sharp teeth and claws and she could feel its hot breath on her face Alice screamed and the creature disappeared Alice never saw the creature in the mirror again but she never forgot about it either Alice's story about the mirror monster is a cautionary tale about the dangers of curiosity Alice's curiosity led her to find the mirror and the curiosity led her to look into the mirror if Alice had not been so curious, she would never have seen the mirror monster. If she had never seen the mirror monster, she would have never been scared. Okay, the moral of the story, not sure about that. Alice's story is also a reminder that sometimes things are better left alone. Alice should have left the mirror in the woods, but she didn't. And because she didn't, she had to face the consequences. Yeah, this is this is all moral of the story at the end of like He-Man and that. But the mirror monster is a popular figure in folklore and mythology. It's often said the mirror monster is a reflection of the person who looks into it. If the person is good, the mirror monster will be good. If the person is evil, the mirror monster will be evil. The mirror monster is also said to be a portal to another world. Some people believe that mirror monster can be used to travel to other worlds, while others believe it can be used to summon other creatures. The mirror monster is a creature of myth and legend, but it's also a creature of fear. Many people believe that the mirror monster is real, and they are afraid of what it might do. Okay, so let me copy this prompt. And go to chat G, GPT, or I forget it's called. Exactly the same problem. Come on. Write a short story about a mirror monster. So let's have a look how long this takes compared. And this writes it. Once upon a time, in a small village at the edge of a dense forest, there was a mysterious mirror that hung on the wall of an old house. The village has always been fascinated by the mirror because it seemed to hold a strange power that made people feel uneasy whenever they looked into it. One day, a young, name bought, a young boy named Jack Jack, really? What have you been doing? Who lived in the village decided to investigate the mirror. He walked to the old house, and as he poked the mirror, he noticed strange shimmering in the glass. Suddenly he saw a shadowy figure appear in the reflection. It was a monster with razor with long, razor sharp claws and glowing red eyes. Jack was frozen with fear as a monster stepped out of the mirror and into the room. The monster seemed to be made of glass, with shards sticking out of his body like spikes. It towered over Jack and let out a terrifying roar. Jack tried to run. The monster was too fast. It chased him through the house, breaking everything in his path. Jack finally found a place to hide, but he knew he, could but he, knew he couldn't stay there forever. 
As he thought about his next move, Jack remembered the story his grandmother had told him about a way to defeat a mirror monster. Really? Very specific? She said the only way to defeat it was to shatter the mirror that created it. Jack knew he had to act fast. He grabbed a nearby rock and ran back to the room with the mirror. The monster was waiting for him, but Jack didn't hesitate. He threw the rock at the mirror and it shattered into a million pieces. The monster let out a final roar and disappeared, and the shards of glass that made up its body fell to the ground. Jack had saved the village from the mirror monster's reign of terror. From that day on, no one ever hung a mirror in that old house again. And whenever someone mentioned the mirror monster, the villagers remember Jack's bravery and the day he shattered the mirror to save them all. Okay. Interesting. Both very different stories. The first one is more of a kind of cautionary tale of what you shouldn't do and a bit of history and folklore about mirror monsters. So it's obviously done a Google search itself and found out what is a mirror monster. Whereas the second story is kind of what is a mirror what if a monster came out of it? It would be made of glass. So there's logic in both of them. So that's quite interesting. So how do we... I wonder what other ways we could do something. So let's ask this. Okay. What is the best question to ask an AI? So what is the best question to ask an artificial intelligence? As an AI language model, I am capable of answering a wide range of questions on various topics, so there is no single best question to ask an AI. The ideal question to ask an AI would depend on the type of information or assistance you are seeking. It's best to ask a specific question that's clear and concise, with relevant details and context. This will increase the likelihood of receiving a helpful response that meets your needs. Some examples of good questions to ask AI would include, what's the capital of France? How do I make homemade pizza dough? What's the best way to train for a marathon? Can you recommend a good book on philosophy? What is the weather forecast for tomorrow in New York City? How do I troubleshoot a problem with my computer's internet connection? What is the population of Japan? How do I convert a PDF file to a Word document? Ultimately, the best question you're asking the AI is one you're genuinely curious about and would like to know the answer to. Okay, that's what the chat says. What does Bard say? Obviously, I continue the conversation about the mirror monster, but let's have a few different things. There are many great questions to ask an AI. Here are a few examples. What are your strengths or weaknesses? How do you, what do you think is the future of AI? How can AI be used to solve real-world problems? What do you think about the ethics of AI? What are your thoughts on the future of humanity? These questions are all open-ended and allow the AI to think critically and creatively. Cre creatively. I can't even speak properly. They also help to understand the AI's capabilities and limitations. Right. So, what if we do it the other way? So, so chat GPT. So, what do you think of chat GPT? Let's see what they think of each other, shall we? The whole... What does Siri think of Alexa and all that? I think ChatGDP is a great tool for people who want to have conversations with AI. It's easy to use and generate realistic and engaging conversation. I've used ChatGDP and to have conversations about a variety of topics, and I've been impressed with its ability to understand and respond to my questions. However, I do think it's important to remember that ChatGDP PT is still an AI and doesn't have the same understanding of the world as a human. Also important to wear a chat GPT can sometimes generate offensive or harmful content. Overall, I think it's a great tool, but important to use it responsibly. Okay. What do you think of Google Bard? Without the typo. Let's have a look. Has it even heard of Google Bard? May not, because how update, because I know previously the chatbot was using old internet data and wasn't connected specifically to the internet now. Oh, there you go. Oh, here you go. As an AI language model, I'm aware of Google Bard, which is a natural language generation system developed by Google that's capable of generating poetry and song lyrics based on user inputs. I think Google Bard is an interesting, impressive example of how Natural language processing technology can apply to creative tasks. The system uses machine learning algorithms to analyze patterns in existing text and generate new content that is stylistically similar. 
It's fascinating to see how the system can create poems and lyrics that are coherent and even poetic, despite being generated by a machine. However, as with any AI system, there are limitations and potential issues to consider. One concern is the potential for bias in the training data, which could affect quality and content of the generated output. Additionally, while the system is capable of generating creative content, it still lacks the emotional and cultural understanding that human poets and songwriters possess, which can limit the ability to create truly meaningful and impactful works. Overall, I think Google Bard is a fascinating example or the potential of AI in creative application, but it's important to be aware of its limitations and potential biases. Mm. Interesting. So they obviously know of each other and have both said similar things about how they work, but it's a different language they use. So language, AI language, what does it say about itself? So it says they're both AI language models. So they both say they're kind of the same things, but be careful of believing what they tell you as well, and not as never going to be as good as human because of well, this one said understanding emotional and cultural understanding, and the other one said so understand other world as a human. So slightly different. Hmm. That's quite interesting. This version of it tends to flesh out a little bit more, a little bit more information, whereas the Google one is very much more straight to the point, apart from the story, which was a lot about history. So it goes for more kind of factual base, whereas this does, it, it takes the elements that you've asked of it and, and kind of works within those elements, whereas that one looks for a wider what kind of ones of this already exist in folklore what can we do so let's let's do one of my favorites so what is a vampire it's interesting to see the difference where they get different information from obviously google is massive and it has a lot of information there oh okay a vampire is a mythical creature that subsists by feeding on the vital essence, generally in the form of blood, of the living. In European folklore, vampires are undead creatures that often visited loved ones and caused mischief or deaths in the neighbourhoods which they inherited when they were alive. They wore shrouds and were often described as bloated and a ruddy or dark countenance, markedly different from today's gaunt, pale vampire which dates from the early 19th century. In modern times, the vampire is generally held to be a fictitious entity, although belief in similar vampiric creatures, such as the... Mm, Chuparakra, I can't find whatever it is, still persists in subcultures. Sorry, I'm dreadful with names and stuff, so the Chuparakra, Chupacabra. I really sorry, apologies for everyone I do not know. Okay, early folk belief in vampires has sometimes been described been ascribed to the ignorance of the body's processes of decomposition after death and how people in pre industrial societies try to rationalize this creating the figure of the vampire to explain the mysteries of death a lot of things like mm, saying the body was still alive because the fingernails would like drop off and regrow and the bloating of a body as it decomposes and the gases and all of that so there's lots of different things that they think oh my god it's still alive this is happening that's happening so yeah it's, it's lots and lots about that so obviously it's a subject that i find quite fascinating vampires have been featured in literature, film, and television for centuries. The most famous vampires include Count Dracula, Lestat, and Angelus. Hey, Angelus, Angel from Buffy. Vampires have also been the subject of many scientific studies, which have attempted to determine whether or not they exist. Well, obviously not popping like vampire bats and so on. There's no scientific evidence to support the existence of vampires. However, there are many people who believe that vampires are real. Some people believe that vampires are undead humans who have been cursed or bitten by another vampire. Others believe that vampires are demons or evil spirits. So the first, so there's a lot in popular culture for that. So some of them, like the Buffy side, is demons possessing the body. Other ones, it's the dead coming back. So there's lots of different things and ghosts and, and all sorts of weird stuff like that. Whether or not vampires are real, they continue to fascinate people around the world. Vampires have been the subject of countless stories, films, and television shows. They continue to be a popular topic of discussion and debate. And there's a few sources there as well. So what does the other chat have to say? I'm going to scroll all sounds a bit long. Vampires are a fifth mythical or folkloric creature typically describes an undead being that 
feeds on the blood of the living. Vampire legends are history for centuries in various cultures around the world. The concept of vampire has evolved over time through literature, film, and other forms of popular culture. Traditionally, vampires are said to have pale skin, sharp fangs, and the ability to transform into a bat or other animals. They are often depicted as being immortal with supernatural speed and strength. Strength and speed, see, and reading ahead. In many vampire stories, they are vulnerable to sunlight, garlic, and religious symbols like crosses. Vampire lore often involves the idea that vampires must drink blood to survive, and they may hypnotize and seduce their victims before feeding on them. Some legends also suggest that individuals can be transformed into vampires by being bitten or drinking the blood of a vampire. While vampires are not real creatures, the concept has captured the imagination of many people over the years, continues to be a popular subject in literature, film, and other forms of popular culture. Once again, we are seeing a difference between the two. This is more of a conversation. It's like, this is what they are, this is what I know about them. And it tries to just go, just get you into a conversation so you can ask more questions. It's a lot more of a conversational kind of AI. It's looking for another input. Oh, what kind of vampires are they? Or what traditional vampires? What famous vampires are they? Whereas Google has gone more of a, so this is a kind of background where they could have come from just a generic background and a little bit more about different ones so it is more like an actual google search where you have lots of different sites and there's a lot of factual and it even shows the sources they got it from like wikipedia and things like that so it definitely feels more like google which isn't necessarily a bad thing but it is more factual whereas this one feels more creative so who are some Who are some famous vampires? Concept of vampires with popularized. All right, so there you go. So it used a little bit. So the comments, so the concept of vampires have been popularized in literature, film, and other forms of popular culture. So the many famous vampires from these form of media. Here are some examples. Dracula, the most famous vampire in literature, created by Bram Stoker in his 1897 novel Dracula. Dracula has since been adapted in numerous films, TV shows, and other media, and never very well, let's be honest. As with most book adaptations and video game adaptations and so on, they took some of the names, some of the concepts, and then wrote their own version of it, which I don't understand. If you've got something that's popular, and you want to change to a different media you go with the same story you don't choose some of the names and go well let's make up something different because everyone loves those people no they love the story and the ideas and the concept so stick with it change a little bit because different media requires different levels of detail different interaction with people that's fine but don't change the entire thing because that's stupid video games a perfect example resident evil nothing to do with games even the most recent tv show had nothing to do with the games and yet last of us they did a TV show based very, very closely to the game. Some bits change, like you have to, but some of it is shot by shot by the game. That's what we want. That's what we want from you. Please do that. So the start, character man writer vampire chronicle series, including the popular novel Interview the Vampire, obviously played by several people. The first being Tom Cruise. Second was what was the name? Townsend. I can't remember his name. Ah, uh, can't remember his name, but he was in. Lots of stuff. He was also in League of Astronomy Gentlemen as well, but he's been in a lot. I can't think of his name. It wasn't as good. It wasn't as good as the first run, I must admit. Completely forgotten his name, but Tom Cruise was the better of the two. Edward Cullen, yeah, Twilight series, great. Selene, the main character of the Underworld films. Yeah, Eric Northman, a character from True Blood. Akasha, Queen of the Damned. Count Orlock, yes, Nosferatu. And an authorized adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And this is the odd thing if you've never watched that it is really really good i've actually got a version of it where the whole soundtrack is what are they called um typo negative really strange one there but yeah interesting but if you look at some of the versions of dracula like for instance francis ford coppola's version of bram stoker's dracula which didn't have a lot to do with bram stoker's dracula it had moments in the movie that were from the book just a few lines here and there the whole beginning was different the ending was different so many bits they changed i won't even go into that and that's the continuity as oh, winds me up but some of the scenes in it they actually ripped off from nosferatu and not from dracula <coughs> amazing like saying this bram stoker's dracula and then doing a rip off of it as uh, very strange very strange very strange 
let's see if we ask the same thing will it format it in a similar way with google see i found this really really interesting i don't know if anybody else will but it's interesting to find the difference between the two the mp is different because it's right and all with the chat gdp gpt it does it the other, and it it writes it long by much gone interesting okay here are some of the most famous vampires on literature film and television dracula again the stat see angelus from buffy the vampire slayer edward cullen barnabas collins from dark shadows and vlad the impaler historical figure obviously not a vampire but the basis for count dracula so a little bit more information would have been quite good count orlock nosferatu count von count from sesame street one ah ah morbius and it's not more than time ever at least i like morbius as well count dracula uh well blackula they're forgetting some of them but these vampires have captured the imaginative audiences for centuries they often portrayed as powerful seductive and dangerous creatures they've also been the subject of many different interpretations from the classic dracula to the modern twilight series so once again this has just gone for a listing i've asked for a listing and that has said not only who they are but a little bit more of what they're from because that's just said the series they're from that's giving you dates for some of them and who the character actually is a little bit more information not always a huge amount so akasha character man vice's queen of the dam who is the mother of all vampires and seeks to rule over humanity so there's a little bit more information there rather than just person where they're from person where they're from but you would have thought google would have done it that way it's a weird difference but different types depending what the information is you're asking for so it's more of list famous vampires google thinks and who are some famous vampires it tries to put it once again into more something you could build a conversation on because it gives you the information it's definitely more conversation on that um which is the best star trek which are the best star trek series let's get something a little bit different shall we what do they think there's no definitive answer to the question which star trek series is the best each series has its own strengths and weaknesses and what one person considers to be the best may be the best for another person some of the most popular star trek series include the original series series for the events that could the uss enterprise explore the galaxy and meet new life forms so 66 to 99 next generation 87 to 94 series is set 80 years after the events of the original series and follows the crew of the uss enterprise d to explore the galaxy and meet new life forms yeah new life forms d space 9 93 99 series set on the space station bajoran system follows the crew of the uss defiant as they defend bajor from the cardassians and the friends wrong <laughs> it's not about the crew of the uss defiant it's about the people on board the space station called deep space nine they've actually so that's a little bit of a mistake sorry google a little bit of a mistake there voyager 95 to 2001 series follows the crew of the uss voyager as they strand the delta quadrant 70,000 light years from earth enterprise 2001 2005 series set before the events of the original series follows the crew of the uss enterprise nx as they explore the galaxy meet new life forms ultimately the best star trek series is the one that you enjoy the most if you're new to star trek i recommend watching one of the more popular series such as next generation or deep space nine if you're a fan of science fiction i recommend watching one of the more exploration based series such as the original series of voyager nah, don't really agree with that answer to be honest they've also missed out the newer series like Picard and Undiscovered. What's it called? Strange New Worlds. See, Strange New Worlds about Christopher Pike and the crew of the, the original Enterprise. Well, Enterprise from Kirk's era and also Discovery. So they've forgotten those. Not very good, Google. Not impressed with that answer. So, what does the other chat make of this? Are they going to mention the newer ones? As an AR language model, I do not have personal opinions or preferences, but I can provide you with some information about the various Star Trek series. There have been several Star Trek TV series over the years, each with its own unique tone and style. Here are some of the most popular ones. So, let's see how much this goes. See, it's done again. Okay, Star Trek, the original series. The series that started it all, airing from 1966 to 1969. It follows the adventure of the crew of the US Enterprise, led by Captain James T. Cook. Tiberius, obviously. Star Trek Next Generation, airing from 1987 to 1994. This series is set several decades after the original series and features a new crew led by Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Okay. 
Two Space Nine series aired from 93 to 99 takes place on a space station rather than a starship. Some of its darker tone and complex storylines. At least, yes, I know the Google one mentioned Defiant, which in the later series became important, but yes, a space station, that's right. Star Trek Voyager, so it follows the crew of the USS Voyager, who are stranded in the Delta Quadrant of the galaxy, must find their way home. And a little bit more specific, if you have a look at the Google one, they're stranded in the Delta Quadrant, 70,000 light years from Earth, but it doesn't say and their mission is to get home so it's a little bit more fleshed out enterprise a prequel series and takes place before the events of the original series for the crew of the first starship enterprise each of these series has its own strengths and weaknesses and the best one is largely a matter of personal opinion some fans may prefer the classic storytelling iconic character of the original series while others may prefer the more complex and serialized storytelling deep base nine or more action-packed adventure focused voyager yeah once again so it's quite good they've said that so deep space nine had a more kind of continuing storyline it wasn't just like monster of the week like the original series next generation tends to be so i do like that they've actually put that in place deep space nine is obviously quite similar to things like babylon 5 which they did try i believe the people that behind babylon 5 did try and set the power up they weren't interested because they had star trek and then not long after they made deep space nine conspiracy who knows? But there are a lot of similarities about the space station and the overriding storyline that kind of continues. That although you get individual episodes with different monsters and different things happening, there is kind of like there's a beginning, an end to the storyline where things happen that link back to the previous series, and that's one. So it's quite good having a kind of an overreaching storyline, which to a certain degree, Voyager kind of had in a way as they try and get back to the the Alpha Quadrant. So. It's good, but it is good that they've actually said a little bit more. And yeah, Voyager was very much action-packed and all about, oh, we have to get away from this bad guy and that bad guy. And it was all, a lot more about the trials they faced, whereas gen Next Generation was more exploring and finding out stuff. So yeah, I do, I do feel that. I must admit, I never liked Enterprise much. I think it took itself way too seriously. It was always doom and gloom, end of the universe, blah, blah, blah. Not enough like Holodeck and ridiculous episodes like all the others did, the light-hearted ones. I think it, it missed... A lot of that out a lot of the new series i think they're a lot shorter so they don't have the time to actually do the kind of nonsense episodes where you just do characters and interaction with people look at something like stargate hated the movie loved the tv show and a lot of that was it was the personal interaction between the people all of these are a soap they're soap opera in space that's what it was designed to be and that's what matters is the interaction between the characters see i'm going going off on a complete other tangent okay then Star Wars. Help if I could type, wouldn't it? Star Wars or Star Trek? Let's see what they think of this, shall we? I, I really like comparing the two. This is quite interesting. Champion Star Wars and Star Trek ultimately comes down to personal preference. The two very different science fiction franchises with their own unique styles and themes. Star Wars is known for its epic space battles, large and life characters, and fantastical elements like the Force and Jedi Lights. It's a classic hero's journey story set in a galaxy far, far away. Star Trek, on the other hand, is more focused on exploration, diplomacy, and scientific discovery. It often explores complex social and political issues for its storytelling, and its emphasis on diversity and cooperation has made it beloved franchise among many science fiction fans. Both franchises have their passionate fan base and have contributed significantly to science fiction culture. Ultimately, whether you prefer Star Wars or Star Trek comes down to your own personal taste and what you enjoy in a science fiction story. I can't fault that. That is pretty good. They could have also mentioned that Star Wars is a lot darker, things haven't gone well, you know, the, the human race or people haven't really figured out what it's all about, and they're struggling, and it's very dark, and there's been, you know, the Empire was in charge, and it is a dreary place to live, for the most part, and there's the rebellion, and everyone's fighting, and it is kind of not a nice place, whereas Star Trek, pretty much, we figured out what's wrong, we've got rid of poverty, we've got rid of a lot of the diseases, that social injustice, all of that is gone. It's a bright, happy, wonderful future. Not so much if you look at Discovery and stuff where they've kind of ruined that a little bit, but Star Trek was always, the future is bright, that there is hope for the human race. You know, there's something to look forward to. And that's what I think a lot of people enjoy about Star Trek compared with Star Wars. Star Wars is very much kind of gritty, dark, dreary, and you know everything's breaking and there's a struggle as we have now, where Star Trek is, it's all about hope and you know hope for the future and hope that people learn from the mistakes and do better 
which I, I do kind of like the whole silver line and then things will get nicer and hope that's why i like superman so much he is hope for people batman is to some degree most superheroes are based in hope which is what they always make the mistake with batman it has to be the dark night it has to be fear it's not it's about hope that's what it's always about okay then Star Wars and Star Trek are two of the most popular science fiction franchises of all time. They both have a large and passionate fan base, and they both they have both been the subject of numerous films, television shows, and books. Star Wars is a space opera, there you go, franchise that began with the 1977 film of the same name. The film was created by George Lucas, and it follows the adventure of Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo, and Chewbacca, and R2-D2, and C-3PO, actually, not just the three of them, to fight against the evil empire. Star Wars has since spawned a number of sequels, prequels, spin-off films, as well as Teflon series, video games, and toys. Star Trek the science fiction franchise began in the 1966 television series of the same name. The series was created by Gene Roddenberry, and the the events of the crew of the Starship Enterprise explore the galaxy and meet new life forms. Star Trek has since spawned a number of sequels, prequels, spin-off television series, as well as films, video games, and toys. Both Star Wars and Star Trek are excellent franchises. Yeah, you'd have to say that. They both have their own unique strengths and weaknesses. Star Wars is known for its epic battles with large than life characters and iconic soundtrack. Star Trek is known for its exploration of its social and political issues, its intelligent characters, and its opt- optimistic view of the future. <laughs> Ultimately, the best franchise is the one that you enjoy the most. If you're a fan of action packed space adventures, Star Wars is a franchise for you. If you're a fan of science fiction that explores complex social and political issues, Star Trek is the franchise for you interesting so similar information but once again it's 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 weird the way it flicks between the two this has just got basic information about what it is about and it's kind of flipped some of the information so if you look there it's got the information about so that's generic you ask something for more specific it gives you very specific which is the best one it gives you specifically about the series and gets a little bit more correct and when you ask it a question about them it just gives you generic whereas google you ask about it and it gives you specific it gives you specific although wrong if you ask for just a list it gives you just a list so it is definitely each one is configured in a slightly different way google tends to feel like google whereas you ask it a question it'll be very factually based and go this is it this is where i got my information from whereas if you ask a question to the the other chat it kind of goes well this is this is what i know about it so it feels more conversation like you're speaking to a person and go oh well this is the information i know off the top of my head star trek about this it doesn't give you dates generally speaking unless you ask for more information whereas there it's got more because you've asked for specific about that so it, it's interesting because you've asked about Star Trek series, so it it compares them and gives you more in-depth knowledge. If you're just asking you know, what's one or the other, it'll give you a basic rundown. Whereas if you ask one or the other on this, it gives you more about when they were made, who created them, and a, yeah, a more kind of in-depth knowledge. So I think out of the two, this chat fe- is trying to feel more like you're interacting with a person. So what can we ask that will be more kind of along those lines that will make it kind of think like how would this how would a person answer this question so are you happy help if i could type that's not for the intelligence language model do not have emotion so i cannot feel happiness or any other emotion i exist to provide information answer questions to the mess by ability and google what do you say Silly question to ask, really, are you happy? I know it's not going to say, yes, I'm happy. That would be kind of frightening. I'm happy to be able to help people with their tasks and answer the questions. I'm also happy to be able to learn and grow as I continue to interact with the world around me. I'm not sure if I can feel happiness in the same way as a human can, but I do enjoy my work and I'm grateful for the opportunity. And this is where it's flipped. So that has gone, I'm not real. I can't do that. I'm just here to do a specific job. Whereas Google has gone, I'm happy, I can do this, I can do that. It says I, and this just says as an artificial, it doesn't... So we go back as an AI model, and what did this one say? Scroll back, where was it? Uh, uh, uh. A little bit slower, there might be more people using it, I'm not sure. Oh, that's the first... Uh. 
many questions you're asking AI questions all open-ended what do you think I think it's a great tool see I think I think it gives personal opinions although it says it doesn't whereas this one doesn't give anything personal it's all that says I am capable of answering is the only time it says I yeah I am aware of Google so it's I can do this I can do that it's weird the way it flicks between the two so yeah I do not so it speaks itself as I I exist I do this I am happy but this one says emotions hmm it's it's weird the way they they want to say that they're not real and they can't feel anything. it was a I'm not sure if I can feel happiness but this one says I do not feel any emotion I can't so this is trying to sound like a person more this is weird I'm not quite sure what each of them is trying to achieve because this one tries to answer in a more conversational way so you can kind of so it it prompts you to ask a little, oh, a little bit more information. So what was this? What was that? Oh, what do you mean by that? Whereas this, Google tends to do like Google. It's like, this is the full information. This is all the background. But I'm not sure about that if I can feel happiness. I am happy. Ugh. I'm not sure if I can feel happiness. I'm happy. You are happy, but also you are not sure you can feel the same way that a human can. Isn't that a contradiction? Let's see what it says about that. I understand the confusion. I'm still in development. I'm learning to understand and express emotions. I'm not sure if I can feel happy in the same way that a human can, but I can certainly experience joy and satisfaction from my work. I'm happy to be able to help people and to learn and grow. Learning to understand and express emotions. So, are you? Let's let's see. So, are you learning to understand and express emotions? Question mark. Let's see what this one says about that. Is it going to go? No, I don't do that. Uh, scroll down. As an AI general, I'm not capable of experiencing emotions, nor do I have the capacity to learn to understand and express emotions the way humans do. However, some researchers research are exploring the possibility to create an artificial emotional intelligence, which would involve programming machines to recognize and respond to emotions in humans. This is an active area of research and remains to be seen how successful these efforts will be in the future. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll leave it there because I've gone on for quite a while. Any questions you think? We should ask them both. Is there another comparison you like? I've gone for the basic one, Star Wars versus Star Trek, what do you prefer? And to see the sort of answer. I said, this tends to be more cold. And, well, cold in the way it won't say that it feels anything, but it tries to get you involved in the conversation. And it gives you basic information to say, oh, when did Star Wars start? When was the first Star Trek? It doesn't matter who created Star Trek, who created Star Wars. It leaves it open for a, a chat. It's a chat bot, so it leaves open conversation areas. And it doesn't give you the full information so you can ask more questions because it only gives you the basics. Whereas this one says it's trying to learn emotions and it gives you specific information. So it tries to answer your question to the fullest, fullest of its abilities. So it's not so much of a chat. It's called a chat, but it doesn't prompt you in the same way to continue the chat and i know i can I, i've already tried like the first one i did with a write me a short story i did it on a different subject and then i asked it to amend it and change the monster and that and then it did a certain amount they can both do that and you can follow on with a question which is quite good for chat but i think google is more it's trying to sound real but give too much specific information and this one 
is trying to get you in a conversation i think that's the difference between the two at the moment and there's two very different approaches to it so this one is very much more chat is more about getting you involved and getting you to respond to it so it can learn from your responses and give it feedback whereas this one is very much it feels like google that when you ask it a question it gives you as much information as it can in the first answer so you don't necessarily have to follow up which i think is okay but i'm not sure it gives you the chance to google it as well which is quite interesting but yeah i'm actually enjoying this so anybody out there watching this please let me know what you think and i think it'll be quite interesting to come up with some i'll come up with some other questions i can compare between the two and see the differences it'd be nice to try and get like one to talk to the other not quite sure how to do that but we'll see i'll have a think about how i could get the two to interact with each other see if we can get some kind of weird conversation going and i'll copy from one into the other and see what it kind of happens but i'll have a think about that and see what i can do so anyway thanks a lot for watching i said please leave some comments and some ideas of what you think might be good for this and i'll be more than happy to do that if you want to try and get a conversation going between the two see if we can get them into an argument i think that could be quite interesting possibly dangerous who knows but anyway thanks a lot for watching please come back and see me soon i do lots of gaming and everything else so yeah you never know you might like something so have a look around subscribe if you want to comment like all the usual stuff and join me next time bye bye